two, three. Test one, two, three, one, two, three. All right, can y'all hear me just fine? Head nods. All right, well, good morning. morning. Make sure you go ahead and grab a bulletin for worship this Sunday. Um, Want to say happy Mother's Day to all of the moms in the room. Uh, You really won't know how much you mean to us. Um, At the end of service, this is for the dudes, um, husbands, sons, daughters. Uh, We have uh, roses in the narthex, in the front of the church. So at the end of the service, I I want you to make sure you grab a flower for your mother. And if you haven't already, let her know how much she means to you. Uh, Remind her of a special memory that you have of you two together. Uh, But today, make sure that you dote on your mom. Husbands, dote on the mother uh, of your children. And uh, make sure that she feels like an all-star today. Um, there's only really one announcement that I uh, know of, but uh, the 17th of this month, elders, we will have our session meeting. Uh, it'll be at 6 o'clock as usual. Um, with that said, that's really all the announcements we have. So if you're following along in your bulletin, let's prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalms 95, 6 through 7. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his land. Stand with me, grab your hymnal, and let us sing, Holy, 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 page 2. Page two. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 All the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which word and heart and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful flesh thy Glory may not see, only Thou art holy, there is none beside Thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, 
God in three persons, blessed Trinity. You may be seated. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy are you, God. You stand in complete perfection, surrounded by creatures who proclaim your glory and beauty and holiness for all of eternity. And what a privilege. What an amazing opportunity we sinners created from dust. Once sinners, rebellious, angry with you, wanting to rule our own lives, have now been invited to sing and participate in that chorus. And now we, along with the angels and the saints who've long gone, get to sing and praise your name for your glory and your beauty and your holiness. Father, we ask that you would send your spirit to help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray that the Holy Spirit would move and groan in our life prayers too deep for words. We pray that you would work in us your word to produce faith and repentance, to produce unity in the body, to produce joy and gladness in following your works and precepts. Father, we ask that through all of this worship service, you would encourage us and help us uh, to be faithful children, faithful followers of your Son, Jesus Christ, and your Word. Please move within us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be reading this morning from Hebrews 12, 18 through 29. One of the things that I like, uh, especially about the Bible app on the phone, it kind of prefaces basically <clears throat> what the verse entails. And it's a kingdom that cannot be shaken. For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice who words may the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them for they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if they did not escape when they refused him, who warned them on earth. Much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised. Yet once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase yet once more indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is the things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and all for our God is a consuming fire. 
The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Will children come forward, please? Good morning. Good morning, good morning, y'all. Come on down here. It is good to see y'all. Can y'all say good morning? All right. Did y'all have a good week of school? Are you ready for the summer? Yeah, yeah. Don't clap. Don't clap, please. All right, well, we are continuing to walk through our catechism. Um, and last week, we were talking about a covenant. Can y'all say covenant? Now, do y'all remember what I said a covenant was? Oh, say it again, Kenzie. All right. uh, kind of a relationship. It is a deal. Think about a, a deal, a bargain, something that you and another person agree to. Maybe mom says, if you will clean the room, then I will give you a cookie or something like that. It's a, it is an agreement that two people join where there's something expected, clean your room, and then there might be a reward or a punishment given depending on how you clean your room. There are covenants throughout the whole Bible where God promises things to his children. Uh, so here's, here's the questions this morning, and I'm going to kind of give you an example in just a minute. So here's the, here's the two questions. What did God promise in the covenant of life? That's what we're calling it. Can y'all say covenant of life? That's the very first covenant God makes with Adam in the garden. He says this, uh, what did God promise in the covenant of life? And here's the answer, to reward Adam with life if he obeyed God perfectly. Now let me read the second question. What did God threaten in the covenant of life? And here's the answer. To punish Adam with death if he disobeyed God. So it's, it's, it's one question with two. If Adam obeys God, he gets life. And if Adam disobeys God, he gets death. Now, let me read the Bible verse for us. It is Genesis chapter 2. Let me turn there. Genesis 2. And here's the amazing thing. God gave Adam everything he needed so that he would not sin, that he would be have everything he needed, yet still Adam disobeyed. Listen to what uh, uh, God says to him. Um, it's in verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, I remember it was my senior year of high school, exactly where Gracie is, close to graduation. I was so excited. Senioritis was eating me up. Amen? Yep. And for some crazy reason, my aunt didn't think that I was going to go to college. So she says, Luke, in order to make sure you go to college, I'll make a deal with you. We could almost say, I'll make a covenant with you. If you will go to college and you will complete it in five years, I'll give you $1,000. And then she looks over to her husband. He says, hey, Larry, I just made a deal with our nephew, Luke, that if he graduates in five years, I'll give him $1,000. Will you join that bet with me? He said, yeah, I'll throw in $1,000. So now here's my uncle and aunt saying they're going to make a deal with me that if I will graduate in five years, they'll give me $2,000 for doing something that I was already going to do. So I said, I will take that deal. So we made a covenant. And remember what the promise was. If I graduate in five years, what do I get? $2,000. If I don't graduate in five years, what do I not get? $2,000. So I went to school and I went to work and I graduated in four and a half years and I took that $2,000 and 
and I was getting married. And so we cashed it in on the honeymoon and had a great time. But the point is, that's a picture of a covenant. My aunt said, if you will do this, you will get this. If you don't, you won't. God in the garden told Adam, Adam, you can eat any tree that you want. Just don't eat that tree. If you'll obey me, you'll have life. If you disobey me, you will have death. Well, how does the story end? Does Adam obey God perfectly or does Adam sin? Adam sins. And we'll pick up on that story next week. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are a good God who talks to us, who communicates, and who makes covenants with us. We thank you namely for the covenant through Jesus Christ, the new covenant, where all of the promises are given to us and all of the curses are taken up on Christ. Thank you for being a good God who loves us enough to save us from our sins. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Candy after church. Continuing this idea of holiness, would you grab your hymnals and turn to uh, page 540 and let us sing the song, Take Time to Be Holy. And Christian, sing this as a Christian who is already resting in the gospel and grace of God. 540, in your hymnal, go ahead and stand with me and we're going to sing. Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord, abide in Him always, and feed on His Word. Make friends of God's children, help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing His blessing to seek. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like Him thou shalt be. Thy friend in thy conduct, His likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, let him be thy guide, and run not before him, whatever be tied. In joy or in sorrow, still follow thy Lord, and looking to Jesus, still trust in his word. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive beneath his control. Thus led by his Spirit to fountains of love, thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Amen. Y'all may be seated, and y'all sound so good. Our affirmation of faith this morning comes from the Heidelberg Catechism, and actually two questions. Question 114. But can those converted to God obey these commandments perfectly? No. In this life, even the holiest have only a small beginning of his obedience. Nevertheless, with all seriousness and purpose, they do begin to live according to all, not only some of God's commandments. Question 115. Since no one in this life can obey the Ten Commandments perfectly, 
Why does God want them preached so pointedly? First, so that the longer we live, the more we may come to know our sinfulness and the more eagerly look to Christ for forgiveness of sins and righteousness. Second, so that we may never stop striving and never stop praying to God for the grace of the Holy Spirit to be renewed more and more after God's image until after this life we reach our goal, perfection. Let us, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning we lower our heads before you and we confess that we have too often forgotten that we are yours. Sometimes we carry on our lives as if there was no God and we fall short of being a credible witness to you. For these things, we ask your forgiveness, and we also ask for your strength. We ask that you would give us clear minds and open hearts so that we may witness to you in our world. Remind us to be who you would have us to be, regardless of what we are doing or who we are with. We ask that you would hold us to yourself and to build our relationship with you and those you have given to us on earth. Lord, we rest in the gospel promises that the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. We ask that you, the God of mercy, who forgives of our, of our sins and strengthens us in all goodness by the power of the Holy Spirit, would keep us in your eternal life. Father, as your children who are able to enter into your presence, both with fear and trembling and with boldness at the same time. We lift up many of those on our prayer list. Today we name specifically that you would be with Miss Sue. Give her patience as her body continues to heal and mend. We thank you for the care that she's been receiving. We thank you for Brother Gerald being with us this morning. We pray that you would continue to be with his body as it fights, and to be with his soul as he rests upon your gospel promises given to him through Jesus. We pray that your spirit of peace and calmness would be with Miss Francis and give strength, give strength to Mr. Curry and to Russell and to Trey and to the other caregivers who take care of her. Fill that house with your presence a house of love and calmness. We pray the, a healing prayer for Miss Blanche Ewing. Thank you for the progress that's been made, but pray that you would continue to be with her and strengthen her body, her bones, her ligaments, that she may get up on her own and soon be able to go home. Father, we thank you focusing in on today, on Mother's Day. We thank you for our mothers. We thank you for the sacrifice that all of our mothers have made. Waking up earlier earlier than they wish they would have, wishing they could have slept in longer, had more money, more time to themselves, and yet they sacrificed for their children over and over and over again in many ways that were only seen in secret by you. Thank you for them, Father even the secret things that they did. We thank you for the love that you have given to mothers, a unique love, a love that even, even a non-believing mother has flowing out of her to her children, a love that protects, a love that wraps her arms around to let them know that everything will be okay, a love that accepts them no matter what mistakes and foolish things they have done. A mother's love is very much like your love, Father, and we thank you. We thank you for the strength of mothers. Maybe at times they have soft hands, but their hearts are strong, their minds are clear, and the love that they love us with cannot be broken. Thank you that so many of us in this room, whether our mother is still with us or not, she was a 
strength, a fortress that we could run to, to hide on dark and sad days. She would lift us up, build us back. And Father, we pray for our mothers, that you would continue to be with them and give them health, strong hands, backs, minds, hearts, to love well, to serve you well, to enjoy life. We pray that you would increase their hearts, increase their love for you, first of all, their devotion to your son, Jesus Christ, increase their hearts toward their children and maybe grandchildren. We ask that they would be more and more devoted to your son, Jesus Christ, as the days go by. Father, we ask that you would create in all of our hearts contentment by shaping our desires to be Godward and holy. Let our cravings be for you and not for stuff, and let us taste and see that you are good and be satisfied in that. So as we hold our money with open hands, I pray that we would let the money you've given to us slip out so that we could be generous in our hearts toward your church and to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and turn with me to Exodus chapter 20. And as you do, let me get set up here and kind of give you a forecast of where we're going. We, um, for all intents and purposes, today are finished with the Ten Commandments. That section that we've been on for, goodness, longer than ten weeks, because I think the Ten Commandments... You can't understand the Ten Commandments unless you read chapter 19. So this long little mini-series that we've had in Exodus, um, I will say we are done with, and we are definitely done with for the summer. Uh, So I would encourage you this coming Sunday, or this, this week, to be reading the Gospel of Mark. That's where we're heading to, and we're going to spend the summer months going through Mark. And so just encourage, it's the shortest of the Gospels, It's the most action-packed of the Gospels. So this week, dive into it and maybe challenge yourself. Try to read all of Mark in a week. Maybe do something crazy. Maybe for for the whole summer, every week, you try to read through the Gospel of Mark over and over and over again to get a better and clearer picture. But that's where we will be this coming Sunday. Today we are looking at Exodus chapter 20, verses 18 Through 21. And the reason I paused at verse 21, starting in verse 22, begins the book of the covenant, where God begins to explain um, in application in life how the Ten Commandments are to be uh, read, to be understood, to be applied. And so I felt that this was just a very good stopping point. So this is our bookend to the Ten Commandments. And so as we get ready to finish, let us just for a moment do a quick review. Maybe you have forgotten where we've been. Maybe you're here visiting on Mother's Day. I want you to be included. So we remember at the beginning of Exodus, at the beginning of the book, Israel, they were slaves under the mighty hand of Pharaoh and Egypt. And they were waiting for 400 years for the promises to be delivered by by a deliverer out of the land of Egypt to go to the promised land that had been promised to Abraham centuries before. And in due time, God raises up a deliverer, a savior from amongst them, them, their own, a man who would challenge the king of the world, who would be God's instrument to bring the plagues against the false gods of Egypt. And with his mighty hand, God delivers Israel from Egypt. He saves them. He brings them through the Red Sea and safely provides for them as they journey onward to Mount Sinai, where they will worship God. And this is one of the highlights of Exodus. They have finally reached Mount Sinai to worship God. That's what we've been looking at for a while. We must understand this. It's crucial. And I've said it over and over again. Before Israel worships God, before they are called to obedience, They are first saved by God. Israel belongs to God, and as his belongings, as his people, he then calls them to obey. And we have paralleled that with the Christian life. Christian, 
God did not call you to obedience before salvation. God did not say, do these things and then you can be my child. Mothers don't do that, do they? Mothers love first. And out of that love comes an obedience. So it is with the Christian life. You were saved out of sin because God loved you. And now out of that love for you and your love for Him, He calls you now to obedience. So we have just seen this huge spectacle. The Ten Commandments have been delivered. And now we cast our eyes upon how has Israel been handling the last few verses. So read with me Exodus chapter 20, starting there in verse 18. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled. And they stood far off and said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you will fulfill your promises in blessing the reading and the hearing of your word. Pray that you would give me unction, clarity to preach your word clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's remember where we were. At the very beginning, before God descends down onto Mount Sinai, God had already set up very clear boundaries. Do you remember this? He told the people to get ready to meet him. They had to go bathe and wash their clothes. They had to go do all kinds of things before the God of the universe was going to come down and to meet with them. In, in, Genesis, in Exodus 19, verse 12, this is what God tells Moses. Put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. Y'all remember that? The severity of what was about to happen? If you touch the mountain, if you cross the line, if you get across the boundary, you will die. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, may they approach the mountain. Can you imagine? Mothers, can you imagine being there, hearing that? And here is your squirmy little child who is always running and getting into mischief. And you are told if they touch the mountain, they are dead. That Think of the severity of what is about to happen at this moment. And now we just read what I read. And where are the people at? They're way over there. God says, don't get on the mountain. And it's like, after God spoke, hey, no problem. We are a long ways over there. We're getting as far away as possible. I was thinking about how Israel reacted to God. And I began thinking about my reactions. I remember being in basic training. I did not understand the fear of a drill sergeant before basic training. And then I learned to fear that big round rim and the drill sergeant that walked underneath it, they terrified me. I was scared to death of a drill sergeant. In fact, I was so scared I would not speak to a drill sergeant. I was so scared if I could avoid doing all of the uh, calling the room to attention. If, if, I, if, I could, if I could avoid anything, I wanted to crawl below the floor before I saw a drill sergeant because I knew I was going to screw something up, and I knew he was going to yell at me and smoke me. Put me down in parade or uh, down in the leaning front leaning rest position and smoke me to death. Even whenever I came back and I was done with basic training and I was on the base and I was in a gas station and here comes a drill sergeant, it didn't matter. Even if they had no authority over me, I'm leaving the gas station until that guy or that woman leaves 
and then I'll go in and get my Coke. I want nothing to do with the drill sergeant. That's one type of fear that I remember having. Do you have a person like that in your memory? That if they are in place A, you are in place Z. There's also another person that this week I began thinking about that I had a fear of. But I had to admit it's a different type of fear. I feared my mom. And even today at 36, I still fear my mom. Amen, kids? Got no amens on that one. Okay, you don't, maybe not. I still fear my mom. But now, it's, it's, it's a different fear. It's a fear that makes me want to honor her. It's a fear that makes me not want to cross her. A fear that makes my joking with her still be respectable and not at her expense. It is a fear that makes me want to run to my mom, not run away. Two different types of fear. Do you have a person like that in your life? A fear that makes you want to draw close. Two types of fear. And that's what we're talking about this morning, the purpose of fear. I want to contend that there's two types of fear. There's two types of fear that you experience with God. Everybody in this room, you may say, well, Pastor Luke, I'm here for Mother's Day. I, I'm more apathetic toward God. I don't know. Everybody has a fear of God. And one fear is a running away, and one fear is a running to. And I want us to look in this passage to unearth this. So, number one, I want us to look at Israel's reaction, verses 18 through 19. Remember, once again, let us get in their feet. They have just experienced the greatest pyrotechnic show of the universe. They had front row seats to see God's presence descend down upon a piece of clay that he created. The earth cannot handle the presence of God. There is thunder and lightning all around this mountain. There are loud trumpet blasts from somewhere in the sky. There are volcanic and tectonic tremors shaking the very ground that they are on. There is something unworldly approaching them on this mountain, something that they cannot get close to, something that is dangerous, something that is terrible, something that they cannot look away from, but yet something that loves them. It has brought terror to the people of God. Can you imagine the five senses as they see this thing descending down? And I say this thing, not talking about God, but this, uh, this, this phenomenon that's just coming down, inhabiting the earth. Can you imagine what they felt, the shaking of the ground, watching the mountain tremble? Can you maybe imagine what they might be tasting or smelling? volcanic ash or dust in their nostrils and mouths. This was an experience of a lifetime. And the people were afraid. They trembled, and it says they stood a far way off. I wonder if they ran. And at what point did they run if they did? To begin with, God warns them not to get too close due to the human rebellion and curiosity. But now that they have experienced God Almighty, they stand a far way off, and Moses now has to say, come back. A very good application we can pull right away from this is learning how people react in God's presence. There are dozens, and I'm going to say it, there are dozens of trashy Christian books that people have written talking about they went and met God. And when you read about their account, their attitude, disposition, and encounter with God is as casual as seeing your friend in the locker room or in the hallway or in the workplace at school. It is this nonchalant, what's up, big man in the sky attitude. Yet if you look at God's word, nowhere does anyone have that experience with God. Everybody either falls down dead, falls down in worships, has to be told, do not fear, they repent of their sin, or they run away. 
Nobody says to God Almighty, what's up, big man? Nobody sits in God Almighty's lap as he parades the animals in front of them. Yet there are books being bought at Lifeway of these experiences with God after death and coming back, and they just simply are not true. No one comes to God casually. The angels were created to be in God's presence, and even they cover their eyes before His holiness. The demons fear and tremble before Jesus. All of those are the normal expected reactions, not casual cavalier. Because of what they just experienced, listen to what Moses says to them. Or, or listen to what they tell Moses, rather. He says that they say, you speak to us, Moses. You talk to us, and we will listen. Do not let God speak to us, lest we will die. His very words are like death to us. We, we want to hear from you. We will listen to you. They want Moses to stand in between God and them. They want Moses to relay God's words to them. They want Moses to represent God's presence to them because God's imminent presence and, and His thunderous voice is so overwhelming to them that only God can make God safe for sinners. I remember one day being in lots of trouble with my father. And I was wrong, and he was angry. And in comes my mediator. In comes my advocate, my mom. She gets between dad and me, and she begins to quell his anger toward me. That's what a mediator does. A mediator goes between two parties, and Israel is saying, Moses, you are going to be our in-between. We cannot stand to be in God's presence. He is too holy, too dangerous, too terrifying. You speak to us. This is a mediator, and the Hebrews are asking for that. And what a wise request. It's an insightful request. They realize that having been in the presence of God and having heard the voice of God, that they needed a mediator. And they also knew that God had appointed Moses as the mediator. Now stop and think about this for a minute. At this point, how many times had Moses already dealt with their rebellion toward him? Their grumbling against him. Can you imagine someone in the camp of two million people probably said, who made this guy the leader? Why do we follow him? And now to certify Moses' authority, God does this pyrotechnic display, and now all of Israel says, yep, you're the leader. No problem. You're in charge. You go talk to God, not us. We're not going to have this conversation ever again. You lead. We follow. God sometimes does things like that. How grace, grateful God is and wonderful. They won't question him, hopefully. Now, by having spoken to them directly, the people can't wait to hear from Moses. It is pride and foolishness to think that we can walk right into the presence of God casually. Try to walk into the presence of the President of the United States casually. Try to walk up to the White House. Try to walk up to President Joe Biden at a press conference and see what happens. You'll be surrounded by Secret Service. Think about trying to walk up into Buckingham Palace to meet the Queen uninvited, unknown, unannounced. Two very important positions in our world, and you just don't enter into their presence half-heartedly. How much more so should we enter into God's presence in prayer or in worship on Sunday mornings? I'm afraid some of us would treat Joe Biden, the president, with more respect at the press conference than we would God on Sunday morning, meeting him here at 2698 Ridge Road. Friends, we are meeting God this morning. Let us come with fear and reverence. We need a mediator who can bring us into the very presence of God without the fear of being struck down because of our sin. And this person is Jesus Christ, someone better than Moses, someone better than 
mom, someone better than dad. We have Jesus Christ. Listen to what, what, what the Bible says. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And so that means now we can come into the presence of God the Father because of Jesus. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except what? Through me. Jesus is the doorway, the access to God's presence. Hebrews 8, 6, but it is Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than that of the old covenant because his, he mediates better since it is enacted on better promises. Friends, in other words, you don't have to stand a long way away from God. If you remember the prayer, I prayed that we come humbly yet boldly into the presence of God. We come humbly because of who we know who he is. He is a terrifying, amazing powerful God, and yet we're able to come boldly like a little five-year-old to his dad and say, Dad, I need some candy. We're able to come humbly and boldly because of Jesus Christ who has opened the door for us. And so, Christian, friend, visitor, I want to ask you a question this morning. Is Jesus your mediator to God? Is he the one who stands between you and God the Father Almighty? Will Jesus stand between you and God on judgment day? In the illustration of my father who is rightly angry and me, do you have somebody who stands between you and the wrath of the father? The Christian does. The Christian has Jesus Christ who steps between, who brings peace. The Christian has a mediator who can quell the anger of God, who satisfies the justice of God. The Christian has someone who allows us to walk into the very holy presence of God. That is Jesus Christ. Do you, on the day of judgment, will you have someone standing between you and God? Will you have a defense, a help, an advocate? Or will you have to pay for your sin with the Holy God. When you do sin, Christian, you find yourself advocating and mediating, or it is Christ who is advocating and mediating for you. If you do not have Christ, if you are not a Christian this morning, it is you who's trying to bargain with God with empty promises of, I'll try better. or try to parade your accomplishments to gain merit before God. The beauty of the gospel is that you can stand before a holy God without fear, without trembling, without judgment, but nothing but grace. Now, let's look at Moses' instruction, point number two. Moses says something that is almost contradictory. Did you, did you catch it when I read it a minute? Moses must be out of his mind or he is saying something that we don't understand just yet. Look at verse 20. Moses said to the people, do not fear. Now underline that. Do not fear. For God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you. Wait, did you, did you catch that? Do not fear. God has come to test you that the fear of him may be before you. Don't fear, do fear. You don't need to fear, but you need to fear. What is Moses insane or is he talking about something below the surface? There's a world of difference between being frightened of God and fearing God. I think some of you this morning, you might be frightened of God, but I want you to be fearful or fearing of God. Let's talk about the difference between the frightened of God and fearing God. That's how I'm going to call it from this point forward. Frightened of God and fearing God. Two, diff two, two things. There is a type of fear that makes you frightened of God and makes you run away from Him, which is a bad fear. It's a fear that the non-Christian that, that non has. It is the fear that the world will have on the day of judgment when they ask for mountains and boulders to be crushed on top of them. It is a running away fear. It's the fear that Adam had. Do you remember the story? 
We talk to the children and what happened to Adam. He sinned. He and Eve, they sinned against God. And when God walks into the garden and he says, Adam, where are you? Why does God have to call out Adam? Why is God searching? Because this is what we find out. And they heard the, the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But God, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. What just happened to Adam? However long he and Eve had been in the garden, we don't, we don't know. Never has he run away from God. Never has he been fearful of God. Never have he and Eve known that they were naked. Never have they tried to hide that. Never did they try to go sow fig leaves. What changed? What changed Adam from having a fear of God, a, a, an enjoyment of God, a fellowship of God, now to running away from him? Christian, you've, you've experienced this. You ever sinned, said something, did something, and the last thing you want to do is pray because you feel so bad. You feel guilty, shame, and so you run. Run to some idol. You run to good works, run to promises until you're ready to go before God, hoping that whatever you've done will allow you to enter his presence. Maybe you sowed fig leaves, hoping that you'll now be able to enter into this presence because you're fearful of God. You're frightened. That's the sin. That's, that's the fear that Adam had. That's the fear that I had of my drill sergeants. But then there is a different fear. A fear that produces humility, reverence, and sensitivity of heart. There's a story in Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going I'm to read it, but I'm going to hone in on the part that I want you to hear. Isaiah has a vision that's very much like the Mount Sinai vision. Listen to what Isaiah says. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. With two, he flew. And the one called to another, said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled of his glory. And the foundations of the, of the threshold shook. And the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Do you, do you see the parallel? This Mount Sinai experience. And now listen to what Isaiah says. And I said, woe is me. That word woe means cursed. Cursed am I, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He sees who he is. He confesses sin, and it is the Lord who makes him righteous. If you continue reading the story. It is a fear that is filled with reverence, not avoidance. It is a fear of confession, not concealment. It is a fear of humility, not of hubris. It is the fear that you have, or it, it is the fear you teach your child to have with a gun. Now, how do we hold a gun? Don't point it. How many... What's, what's the most dangerous gun? An unloaded gun. Yes. What gun has killed more people than any other gun? An unloaded gun. How do we treat the gun? And you instill this fear that still makes them want to pick the gun up, still to be able to use it, but never to treat it lightly. That's a holy fear, a sobering fear. The fear I am talking about is a humble fear that can run to God because they know there is nowhere else to go. There's a story in Matthew 15 of the Syrophoenician woman. She's a foreigner. She has no, no ability to come before this Jewish Messiah, and she's desperate. Listen to this interaction. She comes to him and asks for healing. In verse 26, and he answered, it is not right to take the children's bread and to throw it to the dogs. 
the media would be all over that today. Did you hear what Jesus just told this woman? A foreigner. Please heal me. Heal my daughter. You don't take bread off the table that's for the children and throw it to the dogs. I came for the children of Israel. That's what Jesus is saying. Now, if you know the story, you know. But if you don't, he's testing her. He's not being mean. He's testing her. And listen to what this woman says. This is godly fear. Yes, Lord. E yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. What humility. What reverence. Almost abasement. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desired. And her daughter was healed instantly. It was a test of faith. It's a woman who knows she has no reason to be there with Jesus, yet there is nowhere else to go. And so she risks it all to go to him. That is the healthy fear. It's a fear of, I know who God is, yet where else do I go? I'm coming to you. Listen to what Moses says next. Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. Did you catch that? There's a purpose, that you may not sin. God wants to put before them a picture too powerful, so powerful, it would help fight against sin. It would help lead to obedience. Obedience is what God is wanting from His people. Remember, they're already saved. It's not an obedience to get in the door. They're already saved. He wants a loving obedience from His people. He wants their good. He wants their absolute good, and it can only be found in Him and in the Word. Christian, if you want a good life, it is only found in the Word and in Jesus Christ. Nothing else will satisfy Go try it. Women, men, money, power, politics, fame, none of it will satisfy. It will have a season. You will enjoy it for a season, and then it will turn to ash. Nothing satisfies except Jesus Christ and His Word. And that's what God is trying to instill in His people. Follow me. Taste and see that I am good, and you will be satisfied. But it is our sinful nature that makes us doubt Him. So let me close. Borrowing two illustrations from another preacher. I'm just not this good. Amen. I'm just not this good. And it makes the point clear about what I'm talking about with this fear of God that we should have. John Piper says, I went to visit a man. And Kirsten, my son, six-year-old, was with me. The man had a dog at the door. And when we opened the door and he looked at the boy, eyeball to eyeball. You've been in that place. This is a giant dog. And I sent Karsten back to the car to grab something that we had forgotten. And the dog went lopping up behind the six-year-old at his very height with a low growl. And Karsten was terrified. Uh, the man leaned out the door and shouted to my six-year-old, Karsten, maybe you better not run. He doesn't like when people run away from him. Just walk beside him. You can even put your hand around his neck, you know. God is horrifically dangerous to run away from, and we should be terrified to run away from God. But if we will stay with him, his growl is a growl for our protection, not our destruction. And we can put our arm around his big neck, metaphorically speaking. Mount Sinai was a terrible scene, terrifying, but it was only for their good, not their harm. One more example. Picture a big hole. Or he says... Here's one last image. I like, to, I, I like a picture of a big, holy, sovereign, majestic God. So I picture myself climbing in the mountains, say the Himalayas. And I'm on one of these massive rock faces. And I see a storm coming. It's going to be a massive storm. 
and I feel unbelievably vulnerable on the mountain precipice. And so I am desperately looking for a little covert in the rock where I can uh, uh, get in, where I won't be blown off the side of the cliff to destruction. And I find a hole in the side of the mountain, and I spin quickly. And suddenly the holiness and justice and power and wrath and judgment of God breaks over me like a hurricane. But I know that I am totally safe, which means that all that terrible danger is transposed into a music of majesty, and I can enjoy it rather than fearing it. And I think that is what the cross is. Jesus died for us to provide a place where we could enjoy the majesty of God with a kind of fear that trembling and reverence and all, but not a cowering fear that makes us run away. I liked those images, and I wanted to share them with you. So, friend, this morning, if your hope is in Jesus Christ, if you have been born again, you do not need to be terrified and frightened of God. Especially when you sin, because you have an advocate, a mediator, who brings peace between you and God, the righteous one, Jesus. And so you go to God. Go to God and Jesus Christ. But friend, this morning, if your hope is not in Jesus, then I'm going to be honest with you. You're in a world of trouble. You are in the storm on that mountain with no protection and no hole to hide into. You will be blown off the mountain face one day. But if you will come to Jesus Christ this morning, if you will trust in Jesus and what he has done for you, you no longer have to fear God, but you can enjoy his presence forevermore. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would take these words, this sermon, and use it on my heart. Many times I am not, I do not, I am not fearful enough of you. Many times I treat you very cavalier and half-hearted. And I know many of us in this church are the exact same way. We pray that you would create a, a holy fear that produces humility, reverence, repentance, obedience, love, joy. Help us to be able to enjoy your presence through Jesus Christ. And Father, I pray if someone here has not put their faith in your son Jesus, that you would use the Holy Spirit to stir their heart, not just in the few moments they're in this room, but today, this week, this month, this year, and that you would bring them to your son Jesus Christ. Bring them off of the mountain face into a safe rock to be able to enjoy your presence. We pray these things in your son's holy name. Amen. If you would, grab your bulletin. We're going to sing our doxology as we get ready to close today. Go ahead and stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go and enjoy time with family. If your mother's not here in town, give her a call. If your mother's not here with us anymore, I'll be praying for you as you experience the day. But husbands, sons, daughters, there are flowers in the narthex. Grab one and give them to your mother and let her know exactly how you feel about her today. Let's say a final word. This is from the Lord. A benediction. Therefore, since you have received a kingdom which cannot be shaken by the Lord who says, my cities will again overflow with prosperity, 
the Lord will again comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. May the same Lord fill you with gratitude by which you may offer service acceptable with reverence and all. Amen.